by recording on this computer. Yes, so it started. So Alex, please, <laughs> the screen is yours. Okay, okay, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I will really be repeating the talk that I delivered at the recent conference in Kiev. So I apologize if someone has already listened to it. And actually the results that I will be speaking about are not precisely new. The most of them are already a couple of years old, although not in really the full generality that I'll be speaking today. And also um, part of the Kiev conference was devoted to the anniversary of Skorofort. So I still have this dedication on, on my slides, which actually I don't necessarily need to justify. Anyway, so I switch to so do you see the yes. screen? Yeah, I can also. Um, okay, right. So the talk is devoted to stochastic version of the so-called Kamasa Holm equation and is based on the joint work with Sergio Alvaro and Zdislav Brezniak. And um, okay, so I'll start with the deterministic Kamasa Holm equation. And this equation appeared first in, in the beginning of 80s in, in the work that is shown here. And obviously at that time, it did not have the name Kamasa Holm, and it just appeared as part of the family of the uh, Hamiltonian equations. So just from in some abstract theory. And then some 10 years later, Kamasa and Holm reinvented or maybe reinterpreted this equation in, um, in relation to the shallow water theory. They actually derived it as a reduction of Euler equation. And uh, so from the physical point of view, this equation has some peculiar features, which somehow, so it is in some way improvement of the famous Korteweg de Vries equation, and it has some peculiar features, which the former does not have. And I'll speak about it a little bit later. And, uh, but obviously in that work, the name Kamasa Holm wasn't, well, it was present, but not as the name of the equation. However, the equation appeared to be very, very popular, so which probably shown by the name itself. And both those papers attracted quite a few references, so in citations, the first one some 1700 and the latter one some 3000. And there are also hundreds, if not thousand papers devoted to the study of various aspects of this equation. So it is interesting. Now the equation itself is written here. And okay, so here I use, I use um, PD notations, which means that the subscript means the derivative with respect to the corresponding variable. Now it's, Equation X is just one dimensional here, okay? So, and you see that because of, because of this term, yeah, the equation is non-local. So it's natural to apply the inverse of that to both sides, then it will have uh, the, the evolution form and this term will make it non-local. And that's the main sort of, sort of to say, structural difference from the Korteweg de Vries uh, equation. And then, so apart from this equation, the, the Kamasa Holm itself, the family of non-local equation of, 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 of that type appeared later in the works of Vladimir Novikov and uh, co-authors. And uh, 
some of them, I think there are some of them that, that have physical meaning, but well, we are speaking, we'll be speaking only about the original one. Now, um, it is convenient to introduce a new variable, which is called momentum density. And then in this new variable, our kamasa holm equation obtains the following quasi-linear form. Yeah, so here A is the first order differential operator. Mm -hmm. But of course, this non-locality, it does not disappear because the dependence of A on Y here is non-local, yeah, because this Q to the minus two, this is inverse of that. So that, that's an integral operator. Okay, so that's the equation. Now, there are some peculiar features. First of all, it's the Hamiltonian equation. So there are two independent Hamiltonian structures and this leads to the existence of the infinity of uh, infinite number of conservation laws. Now, second feature is that, well, that equation comes from the hydrodynamics. So you expect something like the existence of solitons and they do exist, but they have, they're peaked. So they are not, they are not, not smooth. And uh, that somehow is related to waves, which are you know, on sea, let's say, which are not really necessarily smooth. Um, now, about the local posedness, it is known that it is, okay, it has local solutions in any Sobolev space with S greater than three halves. But then, Again, the peculiar feature is that the global existence and or blow up of the solutions, um, the equation can exhibit both. And that depends not on the norm, on the size, or even not on the smoothness of the initial data, but on its shape, really. And um, I might say a couple of words about it uh, later on. Okay, so now we come to the stochastic version of this equation. And uh, well, maybe first was studied by a Chinese group starting from 2012. And they considered Kamasa Holm equation first with additive and then with abstract continuous multiplicative noise. But then later, Holm, Christian and Holm, they proposed a version of this equation with so-called convection type or transport type noise. And this is based on some, well, it's, it's not just abstract generalization, it's based on some physical theory. So Holm has quite a few works where he motivates uh, the, the, that this is the right sort of stochastic extension. So what is written here, now the circle stands for the Stratonovich differential and those Ds are first order differential operators. Well, of a particular form, actually. So uh, Xi K is certain good function, and here it's, it's derivative, yeah. Um, now, WK is obviously independent uh, one-dimensional Brownian motion. Okay, so we'll be concerned with the equation of such type, but we'll consider only one vector field here. So a single uh, first order differential operator like that. 
and with certain regularity conditions on, on uh, the coefficient. Now, this work was published not so long ago. This is the reference, and that's the work of uh, myself with Albaverio and uh, Dresden. Okay, so now I formulate the main result. First of all, well, we can rewrite it in the eta form and uh, the Stratonovich differential, since that D is a linear operator, the Stratonovich correction term just uh, rewrites as, uh, as D squared actually here. So that's the equation in the, in the eta form. Now it's considered in LQ for any Q greater than one, so both Hilbert and Banach situation. And uh, well, the result itself is pretty much standard, so which says that there exists a stopping time and a unique strong solution in any H2. Q, yeah, of, of this equation. So that's local solution. And so now I'm going to show some technique and ideas on how to prove this result. And it is based on two things. So one is the so-called dos Sussman method, which is quite an old story actually, which allows to reduce um, the, the stochastic equation to a random uh, partial differential equation, well, partial differential equation with random coefficients. And then this PDE can be solved using Carter's theory and uh, this is in a way this application of Carter's theories the generalization of the work by Constantin and Asher devoted to the deterministic Kamasa whole. Right so now we, we, we do the first step so first we reduce our equation to the PDE and here I need the following auxiliary result, which seems to be kind of obvious maybe, or at least looks like it, it should be easy to find in, in some textbook, but as it quite often happens, it's not the case, at least we failed to find it in, in, the, general, in the generality and formulation that we need. And the result is about exponents of first order differential operators. And so the slammer states that the first order differential operator generates a one parameter group in any Sobolev space. Well, we don't need all, but, uh, and this, one parameter group satisfies usual exponential estimate. And moreover, moreover, what is important that for n equal to zero and one, this constant m capital can be set to one. Well, the proof is, it's basically a method of characteristics and then certain estimates. And uh, I cannot say that it is difficult, but it is quite laborious, let's say. Well, yeah, but, uh, let's say it. so. Uh, the idea is very simple. Yeah, so, and, and you can write this, uh, this group in a sort of explicit form, yeah, so. Here, phi is a diffeomorphism generated by this first term, and then C can be expressed in the, well, in, in terms of the second term. Okay, so that's basically a calculation. 
yeah, and then the estimates and continuity can be just proved by hand. Okay, so now we look for this new PDE. And what we do, so we, this F is the right hand side, the determinee or the, the drift part of our stochastic equation. So we perturb it from both sides by the group generated. Uh, yeah, I have not, yeah, okay, yeah. That's this operator D, that's how, uh, maybe I'll come back to, yeah, that's this one. That's exactly this one, which is our diffusion coefficient. So we take this diffusion coefficient, we form the corresponding one parameter group, and then we substitute the Brownian motion instead of time. So it is a random time in some way. And then we perturb our drift coefficient in that way. Yeah. And then we consider the corresponding PDE, if you want, or rather its integral form. And then, well, this coefficient is, of course, random. And then the statement is that actually for any stopping time, the fact that Z solves this, this equation is equivalent to the fact that Y, which is Z again times our uh, group U, solves our initial stochastic equation. Well, again, this fact, if, if you look at it, so if you imagine that W, if W were a differentiable function, you would be able to prove this fact by just differentiating the solution. Yeah. And well, obviously, you differentiate the group, and then this additional term appears, and it will give you this perturbation. Now, for Brownian motion, it's more complicated than that, but we know that um, Stratonovich differential behaves at least heuristically uh, in, in, in the same way as the usual differential. So we can expect this result at least. But then, and this was used previously in the variety of works where it was proved every time in, in the particular situation by certain methods, uh, actually different in different works. But yes, it can be proved in such a generality by certain rather refined application of the, uh, of the eta form. Okay, so this can be done. And uh, so now we proceed to the study of, uh, of the random PDE of that type. Okay, so what, what structure does it have, this random PDE? So well, I remind to you that our F has quasi-linear form, where operator A is Again, the first order differential uh, operator. So it's all about first order differential operators, actually. Yeah, so A is this first order differential operator with certain with coefficients given by, by um, well, explicit expressions. And then the perturbed F will have the following form. So I introduce certain notations and this a hat is our operator a 
in composition with u and u minus one, as you see, it appeared in three places. Here in three, obviously, because you have v here and you have v here. So once you take the composition of f with u, u minus one will appear twice. So we want to study now the deterministic equation with this a hat. So we forget about the Brownian motion first. So that will be just uh, the, the uh, certain deterministic equation. And in order to study it, we need to know the form of our operator A hat. And uh, this can be calculated. And as it happens, this a hat is also a first order differential operator. However, it's with the coefficients will depend on time and they can be computed explicitly in some, in some way. Means the expressions that are written here, they might look quite complicated. Yeah, because you first you take your V, then apply certain operators. That's again the this one parameter group, uh, which appears here, and then you form well, you form your coefficients here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they, they look quite complicated, but what they give us, they give us a possibility to prove certain estimates on the coefficients and estimates of, of the exponential type in certain Sobolev spaces. And that's what uh, what counts. I actually, I, I, I lost at some point this second superscript q here, but let's uh, consider it fixed. It can be done for any q, so not only Hilbert, but Banach case as well. Anyway, so we can compute in some way those coefficients. Unfortunately, we cannot compute them really explicitly, yeah? because, well, this integral operator q, it, it's not that easy. and. Uh, Right to write explicitly commutators of Q and U is not easy. Right, so the proof how this is done is the following. So if you take any first order differential operator with constant coefficients, let's say, oh, not necessarily constant actually, yeah, and then you commute it with our group u, then you have something that depends on time. Now you can just check because we have u in some sort of explicit form. So you can check by hands that it will have, it will be a first order differential operator as well. And now we can differentiate this expression both sides in I mean, not both sides, but this expression and that expression uh, differentiate with respect to time. And then when you differentiate that one, you will obtain the real commutator of B and C of T. So this can be computed, yeah. And then when you differentiate the, the latter one, you, you just differentiate the coefficients and then you can equate them. And so you can obtain differential equations for, uh, for the coefficients and then, and here you go. So then you can obtain the corresponding estimates. Okay, so that's the proof of that. And the conclusion here is that the perturbed equation has the quasi-linear form and looks very similar to the deterministic kamasa holm equation. Of course, the difference is that, that the coefficients 
have well it doesn't it, you cannot really write them explicitly they're rather complicated but you can write certain estimates of them and so now we can use Carter's theory um, in order to prove the existence of local solutions so now I come to the Carter theory and uh, now we'll be dealing with just an abstract quasi-linear equation in, in a Banach space X. And actually we're dealing with a pair of Banach spaces, in embedded Banach spaces. And uh, so this A is an unbounded operator with domain which contains the smallest space Y. And then Carter's theory requires certain conditions Conditions, not all of these conditions are really very transparent, but some of them are. And uh, okay, so regularity in T, just continuity in T. Um, now, certain kind of Lipschitz condition. Yeah, but, ah, well, okay. What is important actually that our operator A is a bounded operator from Y to X. Okay. And then not only bounded, it satisfies sort of Lipschitz condition as operator from as a function of V. And yeah, okay, is it bounded as a function of U? And then for any fixed time t, this operator is a generator of a C0 semigroup in X. And that so-called quasi M accretivity property, which is also what is important, is an important requirement that the constant is equal to one here. Okay. That's enough to have it sufficient to have it only for certain small v's here, so it's local. And finally, the final condition, which is somehow the less intuitive, is that actually the spaces y and x are not so different. They are, they, there exists an isometry between them. And then the behavior of operator A in both of them is also somehow uh, similar. So it means the commutator of A and operator Q minus one, if you wish, um, is a bounded operator. Okay. So these are the conditions. And the statement is, so under those conditions, the corresponding equation has a solution with some regularity in both spaces X and Y. And the solution satisfies some exponential bound, but it is local in the sense that it, it lives only until, well, no, it's incorrect to say that, but it's proved that it exists up to certain time t prime and this t prime it, it could be any time which satisfies certain estimates but uh, you cannot make it too big because for instance this okay both constants r and mu a appear in the Cato condition yeah but you see that this constant r is R in the first inequality and R to the minus one in the second inequality. So it's no way of <coughs> uh, making this T prime too big. Okay. So that's about local existence. Of course, the, the theorem does not say anything about global existence or blow up or whatever. 
Now, well, the, the classical cutter is out, and the proof is, uh, as, uh, as far as I understand, as usually happens for quasi-linear equations, uh, they prove first the existence of the linear equation with operator under such conditions, and then, uh, and then, the corresponding corresponding quasi-linear vanish. Okay. Anyway. I'm just going to use this result. And for the classical Kamasa home, the result was used by Konstantin and Asher with uh, Sobolev spaces in place of X and Y. And um, so this is our, again, our operator A, which in the classical Kamasa home case is independent of time. And then the conditions can be proved and uh, can be checked. And the first one, or one, okay, there are several. So some of them are more or less trivially checked. The one that this operator is a, a generator of the semi-group with the, with the corresponding properties actually follows from the lemma that I formulated uh, earlier. And uh, now it's this sort of kind of not very intuitive condition on the commutator of our operator A and Q. I wanted to do a short comment on it because that's the one that creates some difficulties in our situation. But it actually is equivalent to the to the fact that the proper commutator of isometry Q and operator of multiplication by this function A is bounded in H two, and uh, this is this is a no, non-trivial fact, and it's based on the some non-trivial theory of first order PDO, pseudo differential equations, which can be found for in, in the book by Stein. And uh, okay, I'll comment on the difficulties that it created in our case. Anyway, that 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 all was done by Constantine and Escher and uh, and so as a corollary, just an application of the Carter's theory is that there exists a local solution of Kamasa home in H2. Now, as I'm speaking about the Constantin Asher work, I have to uh, say that they did much more. So they, okay, so this first is what I formulated now, that's well posedness, but in terms of the original variable u, but it's just a reformulation. But also they proved global existence under certain conditions and blow up under certain other conditions. And you see that, and, and that's really a mathematically very uh, interesting thing that they depend not on the size, but on the shape of the initial condition. Yeah, so for instance, for blow up, we need that the initial condition, it's an odd function with the derivative, with the negative derivative at zero. And uh, yeah, so that I might comment on, on this in the end, if I have time. Anyway, so now we come back to our random PDE, or not yet random, just this PDE with the perturbed coefficient. And uh, the fact that can be proved is that our operator A hat satisfies Cutter's condition in the, sub, in the pair of Sobolev spaces with any Q here. In fact, our initial, initially we, discussed it only uh, 
for q equal to two, so only in Hilbert space situation, but then due to referee, referee really insisted that we do it for Banach space case, because he was sort of, he has been quite certain that that's important. And uh, this thing with the commutator and with, with the first order to the differential operator is actually proved only for Hilbert situation in the book of Stein. Uh, the referee said, yeah, that's old fashioned. Everyone knows that it can be proved for any Q. And indeed we eventually we did it, but it took really some effort, let's say. Well, I'm not really an expert in PDEs or is PDEs, so I don't know whether uh, the transition from Hilbert to Banach situation is really important in this case, but so they say. Anyway, so that, that, that can be done, yeah? And then we can do change of time, and it's easy to do it for any continuous function here, so it's easy to see that actually the condition will be preserved. And so we can do the change of time, we can fix a Brownian path, continuous Brownian path, and do this change of time. And then, well, I don't really want to say so many words as there are written here on the slide, but actually it's then it's clear that as that's a Brownian path, so it's possible to find certain time, which is the first exit time of this pass from the interval zero T capital, and then fit, and then the coefficients will fit into that Carter condition, and this will imply the existence of the local solution. And this is for a fixed Brownian path. And then Obviously, as this tour is the first exit time for Brownian motion, so it is a stopping time. And uh, well, you need actually to take its minimum with some something else, that some time which appears from the Carter's theorem, and uh, so it will be a stopping time. And uh, this will imply the formulation of the local existence and uniqueness result as it is um, traditionally formulated in SPD's theories. So, uh, so that there exists a stopping time and a strong solution up to this stopping time. All right, so this more or less end of story. And uh, and although I think that's a nice result because, for instance, in the initial work by, um, by uh, Christian and Holm, where they announced the equation, this, uh, this equation, this Kamasa Holm with transport or convection type noise, they announced certain things, but more or less nothing was proved and uh, so the existence result wasn't proved there. However, of course, this existence result is based on certain methods uh, and uh, both and, and those methods have their um, restrictions which don't allow to do much more, at least, well, at least we don't know how. And so I just wanted to point out those problems, which, and one problem is, which is sort of a technical type of problem, that if you want to consider here multiple vector fields and they don't commute, then you're in trouble because it's difficult to consider a 
perturbation factor of that type of that operator exponent because you cannot differentiate it really i don't know how to differentiate it unless those decay commute now that might be a technical problem which perhaps possible to overcome by some other methods, but I don't know. Now, another thing is that, of course, it's interesting to understand the existence of global solutions and that blow up thing, but Cato's method gives only local existence. So you cannot, again, you cannot proceed here like, uh, in that way. Now, perhaps as I, I have some time, I, I can just comment very briefly on the, well, now classical, let's say, deterministic results on those on, of Konstantin Escher, for instance, of global existence and blow up and to show you why it's difficult to uh, generalize them or to do something similar in the stochastic equations, at least, well, oh, yeah. not, not obvious, yeah? And um, so the first one, the global existence, it's, it's not much to say as it usually happens the global existence is based on the on on the existence of certain conservation law and uh, it's not that simple although kamasa holm equation has infinitely many conservation laws neither of them gives enough information for global existence in this framework because they well they preserve that they show the preservation of norm of their own space anyway some more refined conservation laws can be derived and okay it gives global existence but now blow up blow up is well blow up in the theory of pdes it, it's usually it's not a very simple thing yeah so it's quite often it's difficult to show that the equation really blows and here what happens is the following so if you take the solution u and take its derivative with respect to x and then under under those conditions well that that's this condition is important you can compare this this function well you can derive certain differential inequality and very oh yeah very simple but i made a mistake here it should be square here yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it should be square and so as it is square yeah. here you can solve it explicitly <laughs> but you can uh, immediately see that the solutions the solution goes to infinity as time goes to this thing so this is positive because u prime is negative but of course this comparison the, this inequality it's derived by hands using explicit form of the coefficients so for instance, in our situation, the coefficients are perturbed. We have some information about them, but it's very difficult to prove something, something like that because we only have estimates. We don't, we don't have explicit form. Explicit form is very difficult to compute. Now, this result has a physical meaning because in a some sort of more physical formulation which that was formulated in the initial paper by Kamasa and Holm we look at the evolution of the of u prime at inflection point and so 
again, its evolution can be for, for its evolution, the differential inequality like like uh, the former one can be derived, and it shows then eventually that th this the, this slope of this inflection point actually goes to infinity, and and which physically means wave breaking, so it becomes vertical at some point. And as its inflection point, it evolves as time. So it shows somehow how this wave can, this breaking of waves can evolve and move somehow. And that's this peculiar feature of the equation, which in a way made it famous. And uh, but in some way, of course, for, 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 for solutions of that type, it's certain suburb norm H3, I think, really blows up, but H1 norm of this solution is still conserved because this is the, 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 the H1 is norm is one of the Hamiltonians of that solution. And uh, finally, I wanted to show you the form of those solitons for our equation, which have peaks as well. So that as, as you can see here, those QKs and PKs actually satisfy certain uh, Hamiltonian equations. So um, this is by the way, can be done in uh, the, uh, in, in, uh, for stochastic versions. So that, that was done by Christian and Holm and for stochastic version. And then here they derived certain stochastic equations as well, although I'm not sure that they really proved uh, the existence of the corresponding solutions. They also announced of, uh, of the blow up of the solutions but um, well, they did certain calculations, <laughs> but then the, the proof actually works only in the case where the vector fields, those, uh, those uh, diffusion coefficients uh, are just constant vector fields. And that of course, simplifies uh, very much uh, everything. So, okay, so it's still open problem, although it's already uh, th three years or something past and uh, this field has been quite popular. Okay, so I think that's all. Um, yeah, just a couple of references here and okay, the main one is of course our paper, but then perhaps uh, maybe non less important is the initial paper by Kamas and Holm, 93, and then, well, the rest, including Carter's classical works. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, the equation is very, very interesting. I never heard about it before, but I certainly should study it. Any questions, please? I would like to ask the following. <clears throat> this work by Kamasa Hall 93 has 1,500 references, even more. Yeah, I think it has like 3,000. <laughs> yeah. Maybe so, depending on what server you look at. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just look in MathSignet. Mm. It was yeah. only purely mathematical 1,500. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, as I understood, main uh, enthusiasm was related with the following that this equation uh, produced integrative system. We have solitons and it is very fascinating area of modern uh, theory of equation. <clears throat> but uh, the physical sense of equation uh, 
as I understood, is the following that solution represents so called so called uh, horizontal velocity, it is one dimensional. In, in principle, situation is multidimensional, but solution is related with horizontal velocity, and it is integrated system. Now, uh, when you consider stochastic perturbation, or Christian Holm considers stochastic perturbation, what is the interpretation of this equation with stochastic term? Oh, I think the interpretation is exactly the same. It's uh, just that there are certain random forces that are perturb this equation. It's, it's yeah, like but that. It, you see, if you have any nonlinear evolution equation hmm. and add stochastic term, do you sure that it's always reasonable or? No, I don't know. I don't know about that. And, uh, but um, Kamasa, well, it is, let's say, is in that way. Uh, Kamasa and Holm, in the initial paper, they derived the, this, their equation uh, by doing certain reduction of uh, Euler oil equation. They consider Euler equation in special regime, yeah? Yeah. And then Holm has, as I mentioned at the beginning, so Holm, who's more or less a physical person, mm. so he developed the whole theory of how to and why and how to perturb classical uh, Hamiltonian systems by stochastic terms. Yeah. And, and uh, so he also considered perturbations of Euler equations and certain reductions of them. I cannot comment much on it because that's uh, the whole theory. So it's quite a lot, a lot of it done of it. So, mm -hmm. but he, he is basically motivated by physics, not just by abstract sake mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. abstract generalization. So, but uh, I cannot comment much on it, unfortunately. So uh, I, yeah. I would just can yeah. I can say something. So as a physicist, former physicist, uh, I would introduce stochasticity in case if I'm uh, not interested in dependence upon initial conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, I can do that if I promise not to be interested in some, you know, instantaneous peaks or whatever, but only in long, uh, long time large scale asymptotes. Yeah, this is the way when I can when it's reasonable to introduce stochasticity. But if uh, here the most important thing is uh, peaked solutions, I'm a little bit uh, confused. Why? What is the meaning of stochasticity? So I basically I mm. join yeah. Yuri is this in, in, in this mm. concern? Yeah. Okay. But may may I ask a naive question? Yeah, which is unrelated to particular structure of equation, neither related to particular structure of stochastic perturbation, yeah? So stochastic perturbation should actually reflect the influence of certain random forces, additional random forces, which are present in nature, and uh, and the question, okay, so the initial equation, actually, it's like you have initial condition, so you gave some, you, okay, you initiated a wave, let's say, and yeah. then it started evolving in certain sense, yeah? But then we have, in, in the real world, we have the presence of influence of other forces and in particular some random forces. And uh, the question is, uh, the question, how much those forces really 
perturb the behavior, the initial behavior, whether really those solitons will still be present or they will dissipate completely. That, that's see, see, be yeah. an important question. I see, I see. But yeah. that's of course speculation. I, I don't know anything about about it, but... Uh, well, it's a reasonable question indeed. What should be the magnitude of uh, perturbation which would alternate the nature of the solutions? Yes, this is important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so but I, I have additional question related to stochastic perturbation. <clears throat> Namely, uh, in many cases, if you have, say, hyperbolic equation, yeah, mm -hmm. and you have not much information, if you add a random perturbation, if you had uh, some uh, diffusion term. Your equation became be parabolic and much better. So somehow stochastic perturbation can improve property of solution. Uh, in your case, can you observe this positive no. influence? No, I don't know. I mean, you asked me this question at the conference and uh, <laughs> well, I still don't know. And um, of course, well, what can we expect? First of all, well, okay, I'll, I'll go back maybe to the very beginning just to have this equation here in just in yeah. front of me. So what can we expect at all? So we might hope or not hope, but expect in some way that if our perturbation is quite large, strong, then perhaps instead of this blow up, we will have more global existence, mm -hmm. at least perhaps in, in some generalized sense. But this, yeah, so that, that might be, but this noise, this transport type noise is somehow notoriously difficult. And uh, I know, well, there's some, well, I actually, I know only one work by Flandoli and co-authors where they, um, where, where they prove something like, that for certain equation with the transport type noise, they prove the delay of blow up up mm. to, uh, to some. But uh, mm. unfortunately for us, they prove it in two dimensional situation. Mm. And this is important because they consider, I think they consider divergency free vector fields, mm -hmm. which is, that's of course a technical moment maybe, but uh, so in principle, of course, something like that mm -hmm. might be, might be possible and that would be very exciting, mm -hmm. but yes, it's, it's all open mm -hmm. for now. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions, please? So what's the further, so maybe I'll then uh, turn off um, the, the chat. <laughs> um, so what's the further program of the seminar then? Is uh, Finkelstein is next? Next next week and then we have, I mean, we, we don't have uh, anybody yet, but uh, so if, uh, anyone is interesting to discuss mm -hmm. any type of problems, you're welcome. Yeah. At least we have, you know, a kind of a platform <laughs> now yeah, yeah. for discussing something, something interesting. And, uh, yeah. yeah, well, uh, Yuri invited me to participate in your seminar early on, but unfortunately we, we had some crazy times uh, which uh, because of all those 
teaching problems uh, and so and uh, friday uh, has not been particularly convenient so i, I couldn't but uh, i might try and participate later on if something comes up <laughs> that would be great are you open uh, alex or not yet because open we no we we are all online i see so no face to face courses yet and no no face to face courses and but the, the, it's probably in your place as well no we, we are open we have oh are you open oh right. and uh, from fall all courses will be face to face and uh, oh. Oh, from, from from yeah, from fall maybe. I we don't know yet, but maybe. now yeah, also, now. I mean, now there are some. For instance, my wife is teaching uh, partially online, uh -huh. but most of courses are were already uh, hybrid, so partially face to face, partially uh, online during the spring. Indeed, students try to move uh, online, which mm -hmm. dramatically reduce their how to say, <laughs> actually, uh, grades, and, uh, but nevertheless, they prefer to study online. And sure. now we move totally face-to-face, -to -face, uh, trying to eliminate uh, distance courses completely. Oh, well, yeah, so hopefully we'll do the same from, from the autumn. And although those online thing, although it seems that it should be, should not take that much time, but the paradox is that it does. and. Uh, Actually, the administration of all those courses uh, takes uh, ages. And uh, anyway, how is it, uh, Joao? How is it uh, in sunny, lovely Lisbon? Well, first of all, it's not sunny. Oh, it's not. It's not sunny. No, so unfortunately not. It's like in the UK. Oh, it's UK. In UK, it's been great. The the well, the, the last two weeks, they've been Okay, great. so this means I have to move to UK. <laughs> no, okay. but uh, concerning Portugal, okay, as I, uh, as you know, I'm teaching in the Universidade Aberta, so it's the Portuguese version of the Open University, so we are always teaching online. Oh, but, so it's, yeah. Uh, concerning okay. the, the, the universities in general, it's expected next uh, year, all the teaching courses will take place uh, physically not uh, online but mm. okay who knows yeah, yeah nobody knows yeah no one knows no one knows we have plus 40 celsius during the oh. past two days in the oh, plus 40 celsius okay. and yes actually we usually in july at the end of june beginning of july we have up to uh, up to uh, plus 45 Okay. So oh, we so it's quite chilly. Okay, forty. It's quite chilly. Okay, be careful, Dim. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well. Okay. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I will update the program and uh, also send uh, emails to everyone. So I'm really happy to see you. Uh, uh, Alexander, uh, so how is life in Bielefeld? All is, all is, is best. Yeah, more or less. We have also sunny days, but uh, we are all preparing for the uh, exams right now. I have course with 700 people. Yeah. Okay. So it will be online and one has to organize all this kind of. What about exams? Are they coming, I mean, are they um, running online or not? In your case, so the exams uh, today in the morning came uh, the news that we can do also not online, just the usual one, mm -hmm. but all people started already to organize online. So I think it will be everything online. It looks do, like everything will be online. Do you have some proctoring? <coughs> proctoring May I ask you something? Yeah, yeah, sure. About the exams, the online exams, mm -hmm. do you have problems with the people that are, are paid to solve the examinations? Yes, indeed. yes. So the question is about proctoring, <laughs> how to monitor because that. <laughs> here in Greece, it's a very big problem, this one. Yeah, but it's impossible to, to prove anything. Probably there right. are some, but what, what can you do? Means we have, 
we, we have 24 hour open exams. So obviously yes. they can they can do anything and uh, but well the, what, what happens is that on average the results are better than usual but it's not like everyone obtains 100 percent it, it's still kind of a normal distribution maybe slightly shifted to the right but well what hearing is there are pri private schools that are sending now emails to a phd students to pay them to solve the examinations for other students this is a big <laughs> problem <laughs> so typically we can have a great yeah. reason i see we had a kind of proctoring. Uh, for instance, I use Zoom for proctoring, asking students because if, if, if the class is not big enough, I mean, say about 20 people or 20 students, you might at least to get an idea what are they doing through Zoom. But uh, indeed, in, in case in, of hundreds. In, yes. in the January, I had about 200 people mm -hmm. in the examination. And um, I used about 1,200 emails for the examination to send them the, the questions, and take back the, <laughs> the other questions, the answers, and etc. you know? No, it's administrated they, in a much easier way in, in the UK. I don't need to send any emails, so. Mm. But I need to mark them eventually, that's true. Okay, but by okay. the way, so, so unfortunately,